the election of Jorge Mario Bergoglio by the 2013 conclave turned out to be a watershed moment, not only for traditionalists who reject Vatican II, but also for Novus Ordo conservatives who had placed their hopes in Benedict XVI's hermeneutic of continuity for the council. Bergoglio, the real face of Vatican II that we survivors of the Paul VI era all remember, is loud and proud about his revolutionary goals. For everyone on the right, it seems, he is too bad to be true. The Francis Revolution has led many of these Catholics to examine sedevacantism as a potentially coherent theological explanation for the disastrous state of the post-Vatican II Church. Sedevacantism holds that Paul VI and his successors, due to personal heresy, were not true popes. Perhaps because I've written extensively on the topic over the past 25 years, I hear more and more from souls like this, who have either embraced sedevacantism just recently, or who, confronted with Bergoglio, are now finally willing to consider doing so. And I've encountered many complete newcomers to the traditionalist movement, often younger people, who not only do not regard sedevacantism as radical or shocking, but who simply by applying their basic religious knowledge as Catholics have reasoned to it as the only correct conclusion. In fact, as I was typing that sentence in the original script, I received an email from yet another such person. The recognize and resist, or R and R wing of the traditionalist movement, which holds that one must recognize the post-conciliar popes, but resist them, treats the Bergoglio-inspired drift toward sedevacantism as a cause for outright alarm. In a July 2015 video, entitled Stuck in a Rut, I reviewed some of the R and R polemics on this point that had appeared in 2014 and early 2015. The most recent warning against sedevacantism from the R and R camp comes in the form of John Salsa and Robert Sisko's True or False Pope, Refuting Sedevacantism and Other Modern Errors, due to be published by the Society of St. Pius X in early January 2016. The level of anti sedevacantist panic may be gauged not only from the book's length, 700 pages, but also from the hysterical language of the author's preface, which they posted on the internet to promote the book. Sedevacantism, say Messrs. Salsa and Sisko, is, quote, founded upon the same error as Protestantism, anything but Catholic, poisonous, and leads to heresy. Sedevacantists themselves have lost faith in the Church, manifest a diabolical fervor, mock, ridicule, and discredit the Church, are like unbelieving Jews who are enemies of Christ and have produced the pernicious fruit of a sect. Wow! As of this moment, Salsa and Sisko's book has not yet appeared because of printing problems. We haven't been blamed for that, at least. So at present, one can only look forward to the boxcars of grist the book will provide for this particular sedative contest's mill. But in the meantime, we can consider a broader question. About a week ago, a Catholic who had written for an R&R &R publication, but recently concluded that Bergoglio is, quote, a radical heretic who despises Catholicism, unquote, and therefore not the Pope, wrote to ask me the following. Why is sedevacantism deemed so dangerous by other traditionalists? I simply do not understand the unwillingness to even examine what seems to me, with my current state of knowledge and understanding, clear traditional Catholic teaching. Why do they feel they have to squash it? Does it frighten them? Are they worried about being seen as loons? What is the nature of the mental block that they have? This is indeed an excellent question. 
especially since the R&R versus Sede Vacante controversy is about to heat up again. As someone who has belonged to the traditionalist movement for more than 40 years, and who has researched and analyzed the pro and con cases for Sede Vacantism, I would boil the answer down to three reasons. One, ancient tribal myths. To discover the source for the near irrational fear of Sede Vacantism that afflicts so many traditionalists, one must first look to the traditionalist movement's origins in the 1960s and the early 1970s. Because the Vatican II revolution came from the Pope, and because every good Catholic knew that only non-Catholics did not recognize the Pope, and that only bad Catholics disobeyed the Pope, proto-traditionalists needed to quickly come up with some sort of plausible explanation for rejecting the errors and the evils that Paul VI had officially approved. The argument they cobbled together for resisting the Pope revolved mostly around two primitive notions. First, Catholics are not really bound by what a Pope teaches or legislates unless it has an infallible stamp on it. For example, a once-in-a-century proclamation like the dogma of the Assumption. Second, a Pope could be like a bad dad whose evil commands you can disobey, but whom you recognize as your dad no matter what he does. Both ideas were based on a whole array of theological errors that eventually mutated into what came to be known as the R and R position. And all of these errors have been repeatedly and definitively refuted. But at the time, these primitive notions sounded plausible enough to laymen and priests who didn't know any better. And they were repeated so often over the years that they became the unquestionable mythology that identified the tribe. From its founding in the 1960s, the remnant was the principal organ in the English-speaking world for spreading and defending this mythology, aided by its chief apologist and shaman, Michael Davies. In France, it was itinéraire, and eventually, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre's Society of St. Pius X. Resistance to Rome, quote-unquote, was an easy sell in France simply because a strain of it has run through French history for centuries. Gallicanism, the Petite Eglise, the French anti-infallibility faction at Vatican I, and the French political right-wing's anger in the 20th century over the papal condemnation of Action Française. But we Americans don't exactly have a sterling record either. The traditionalist mythology we are discussing got an early start on our shores in the 1940s with the followers of the excommunicated Jesuit, Father Leonard Feeney, and it has been going strong ever since. The original myths that Sede Vacantism threatened eventually spawned other myths as well. Sede Vacantism could not be true, we were told, because it would leave us without a pope to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart in conformity with the Fatima message. This argument has long been promoted not only by Messrs. Salsa and Sisko, but also by other R&R &R Fatima industry movers and shakers, such as Father Nicholas Gruner, Christopher Ferreira, and Brian McCall. Here, a principle invented on the basis of private revelation, which no Catholic is, strictly speaking, obliged to accept, is supposed to trump public revelation, which Catholics are obliged to accept, and which is the data underlying the theological principles for the Sede Vacantist argument. The tail wags the dog. Finally, if you have been raised in the R&R &R camp, you have been taught to fear Sede Vacantism as schism. If you overcome your fear sufficiently to investigate the position, to raise legitimate questions about your tribal myths, 
and to insist on coherent answers based on principles found in the writings of pre-Vatican II theologians and popes, you are told that you are proud. The latter in particular is a trick employed by Society of St. Pius X retreat masters, who are supposed to give at least one conference aimed at indoctrinating retreatants into the Society of St. Pius X myths. Bad spirituality covers up bad theology. Cowardice and human respect. Though false, the foundational myths like no infallible stamp, no obligation, popes can be bad dads, are easy to explain to relatives or acquaintances who may inquire about your chapel's relationship to the diocese and to the pope. Such folks may be a bit uncomfortable with the idea of infallibility anyway, and most of them have surely known a bad dad or two. Even if someone is a bit skeptical about your answer, he won't take you for an extremist or gasp, someone who actually takes religious beliefs seriously. But lay on family and friends the idea that the smiling, easygoing, non-judgmental, selfie-snapping Pope of Mercy is really a heretic with ideas straight out of hell, and an uncomfortable silence will descend around the backyard barbecue pit. The speaker is immediately pigeonholed as extreme, fanatical, or vaguely disreputable. So inevitably, many traditionalists are inclined to reject Sedevacantism or to poo-poo the issue of the Pope as unimportant, due purely to cowardice and a desire for false human respect. Even though Sedevacantism may be true, they might say, what will people think of me if I say Francis is a heretic? or a false pope. It's easier to stick with R and R. But there's no need to let human respect force you away from accepting the truth and to prevent you from explaining it in a way that will not cause offense. The late Father Paul Wickens brought up the issue in a letter to me in the 1990s when he asked, but how can I tell Aunt Helen? This prompted me to produce both an article and a video by that name to answer his question. A simplified version might go something like this. Baptism and faith are requirements for belonging to the church, and a public sin against the faith, denying or doubting some dogma, puts you outside the church. Catholic theologians, and even one pope, taught that this disqualifies someone from being elected a true pope just as being born outside the U.S. would disqualify you from the presidency. This is obviously the case with Francis because he has said, and then here, you fill in the blank with the Bergolian howler of your choice. Now, that wasn't so hard, was it? And anyway, we're not talking about the recently retired modernist Ratzinger all duded up in the papal furs of yesteryear. We are talking Bergoglio, who has moved beyond okaying divorce and remarriage to giving a pat on the back to transsexual marriage. No market appeal. If the individual layman fears sedevacantism because those around the family barbecue pit might perceive it as extreme, fanatical, or disreputable, the traditionalist cleric, intent on building up some ambitious work of the apostolate, will fear it infinitely more. Unlike R and R's consoling and primitive mythology, sedevacantism is viewed as a hard sell. Moreover, one must understand a few basic theological principles in order to see that it is entirely reasonable and completely in conformity with Catholic teaching. Thinking, ugh, too much work. Sedevacantism would not therefore appeal to a wider market base for moral 
or especially financial support, which would get you institutions like these. SSPX realized this from the beginning. So, no matter what occasional hardline statements its leadership made about Rome over the years, the organization always returned to its original papal mythology. Why change a winning formula when for 45 years it's been the goose that's laid you golden eggs? But once again, this is not just a French disease. It was likewise the fear of losing marketing appeal and broad financial support for his traditionalist monastery, from SSPXers, Sedevacantists, Independents, Indult types, and the R&R &R camp, that prompted the Alabama Benedictine Father Leonard Jardina to remain coy and publicly silent about his position on the Pope, till the day he died. His monks all left, and the monastery property was turned over to the Novus Ordo. Why do traditionalists fear Sedevacantism? They've given three reasons. First, primitive notions about the Catholics' duty toward the Pope that date to the early days of the traditionalist movement and that through repetition have turned into unquestionable tribal myths. No obligation without that infallible stamp, and the Pope is like a bad dad. Second, Fear of what others will think of you if you adopt the Sede Vacantis position, even though it can be explained in a few words, simply and clearly, without giving offense. Third, Sede Vacantism doesn't have the marketing appeal that R&R &R does for obtaining broad moral, but especially financial, support for a clerical apostolate. It is perhaps understandable that in the early days of the traditionalist movement, residual pre-Vatican II attitudes toward the papal office, limitations in the means of obtaining news and factual information, and the sheer physical obstacles to conducting theological research, led faithful Catholics to settle for simple myths to justify resistance to the man whom faith told them stood in the place of Jesus Christ on earth. And it is also perhaps understandable that these myths, combined with those promoted by the press about the conservatism or orthodoxy of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, led many souls to give Vojtiva and Ratzinger, two tomistating modernists underneath, the benefit of the doubt and to give in to the fear of Sedevacantism. But now is the time to put that fear aside. And it is also time to put aside the contorted theories of the tribal mythmakers who destroy the papacy to save it. You can now see with your own eyes and hear with your own ears the poisonous modernist heresies of Vatican II, incarnate in the person of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He is destroying Catholic faith. He is destroying Catholic morality for untold millions of souls, now and for centuries to come. As such, he is no mere bad dad with an unused infallible stamp in his back pocket. Still less is he the vicar of Christ. He is the vicar of the devil, and no one should be afraid to say it.